Easier said than done, but yes. All right. Oh, so, <laughs> hey, nonprofit peeps, it is Rhea Wong with you once again with Nonprofit Lowdown. And today, one of my favorite people on the planet, my business bestie, Brooke Richie Babbage. Hi, Brooke. Hi. I always love talking to you. I'm so excited about this conversation. This conversation is going to be so good. So, we decided to do this conversation because we met on Friday and we were kind of talking about how in both of our businesses for 2024, it just has felt very, I don't know, like shit just fell apart. Yeah. It just, it's felt hard. It's felt like, Hey, I thought I was on this up on this trajectory and then everything kind of exploded. I mean, I came into 2024 with like you know, all this like spiritual energy. I think you came into 2024 ready to like get it. And it and just goals, has been and the goals for the goals, like, you know, yeah. all the classic me for. <laughs> yeah. So I think there's a couple of things here. I feel like 2024 for a lot of us has been just an ass kicker. And and it it's not like we've done anything different or did anything wrong. It's just that things have changed. So I'm just wondering from your perspective, what are you seeing in 2024 with your clients? I mean, I think it ranges from things are just not clicking, right? I'm not moving forward. I feel a little stuck. I feel, um, you know, for those of you listening who love sci-fi, which I do, that idea of being out of phase, you know, where you're sort of just like cosmically out of phase, I hear that a lot with the, I feel that, and I have felt that, and with the folks that I work with, and then all the way to the other end of the spectrum, I mean, I have organizations that I've been working with for years who, for the first time in years, are really worried about their budget going down. Mm, mm -hmm. We saw a lot of that in COVID, and there were structural (laughs) reasons for that, but the sense of, I'm doing the things that have been working, they worked last year. And nothing seems to have changed enough to explain why they're not working this year. And that sense of like frustration and helplessness is is very real. And I think, I think a lot of it, you know, to get a little bit woo, there's something different about this year, not just in our sector. And as you and I know, not just in the business world, this election, and this sense of like foreboding and deeper than that, this sense that there are some real sort of tectonic shifts happening in our society and we don't know who we're going to be as sort mm. of a, is really unnerving for people. Yeah. Yeah. That's such a good way to put it. Cause I've, I've thought about this a lot as well, which is, I think, you know, from an economic perspective, a lot of us are experiencing the post-pandemic depression, right? Like I think a lot of organizations got that pandemic bump because people were at home, they had extra money, they thought the good times were going to be rolling forever. Not the case. So I think that's thing one. Thing two is I do feel like there's some kind of energetic stuff happening. I think the anxiety around inflation, the election, war, it just feels so heavy. And then I think the other thing is donor behavior has changed and buying behavior has changed, right? So like now more than ever, we are just saturated with all of the emails and all of the texts and all of the phone calls. Like I have a robo killer on my phone because I literally receive so many garbage spam messages that it's harder than ever to cut through the noise to actually talk to your people. Do you have a perspective on that? I do. I mean, I, I don't know if you remember, but coming into this year, I always like doing the, like one of my early in the year podcast episodes is different people's perspectives, like what's coming to the year and, you know, and your theme was authenticity and you talked about, and I thought it was really on point. You talked about how coming out of last year, there was so much and people were carrying that noise into the new year, whereas normally people come into a new year and it feels like a clean slate. It didn't for so many people this year. And that focusing less on frequency and trying to make yourself louder amongst the noise, you really zoned in on the importance of if we want to talk about sort of business terms, storytelling, but really just not trying to be noisier, but trying to be real, 
and trying to talk mm. from a place of look this is this is what our experience has been this year join us um so yeah so my perspective is I think that's exactly right I think there is a lot of noise and I think that what a lot of us have learned to do over the last few years is be noisier is send more and say more and do more and I think that doesn't work. I think it does the opposite of what we want it to do. We become part of the whiteness. Yeah. 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 I think that's so good because here's, here's what I'll say too, is I've been thinking about the fact that we have more knowledge than ever before, right? Now with ChatGPT, it's like we could literally create content yes. like that. We are drowning in knowledge, but we are woefully short of wisdom. Mm. You always have such great sayings. I love that. <laughs> Well, I just mean that I, to your point about the chatter and the noise, like there's so much of it. There's more than there's ever been, but there are fewer people out here who I will call, I don't know, the the truth sayers, like the people who speak Mm -hmm. and, you know, in ancient times, it might've been called like the sage of somebody who may not say a lot, but when they do, it's like wise and truthful and like, yes, that, that is the way forward. Um, And so I think to the extent that we can is how do we stop trying to talk to everybody? Let us talk to our people and let us talk to our people in a way that is wise and intimate and authentic. You know, I think one of the things that is scary for people. And this is part of what you and I want to talk about today. I think that a lot of organizations, and this comes up, I know, in conversations I have with the leaders I work with, and you and I have talked about it with respect to the folks in your programs as well. There's a real fear of getting things wrong, Mm. right? Of not knowing the best strategies, of being behind the eight ball in terms of what you are supposed to do and you can't see it, but I'm doing huge air quotes. And I think that most people, well, I'll speak for me. When I am uncertain, one of the things that I feel I can turn to is what has worked before? What are people doing that they tell me works? And so if you think about fundraising, it's you know, there's a certain checklist of things you're supposed to do, right? I do a lot of work around strategic clarity. The number of conversations I've had this year with organizations that have sat down to sort of quote unquote, knock out a strategic plan because you are supposed to do that is, it's crazy to me how many times I've had that conversation. So this this sort of tyranny of what you're supposed to do is locking us into a way of engaging with supporters and donors, our own teams, our own boards, that isn't authentic. It's like, send me the playbook and I'll do the thing you tell me to do, rather than actually pausing for a minute and saying, wait, my organization has unique expertise, or I have a unique story, or we have a different way of doing this, of connecting with our communities, and that's okay. And we're going to do this thing that is real and authentic to us, even if we've never seen it work before. We don't know, you know, nobody's told us the thing to do right now. There's a balance. You also want to <laughs> do the things that work, but I think there's a real fear of being authentic, of standing out, of slowing down and being different because people don't want to get it wrong. Yeah. I'm also going to say something controversial. So I was, before I got on this call, (laughs) I was listening to our favorite Alex Hermosi, and he was talking about how when things are not going our way, we tend to, there's kind of like an onion layer, right? So the first onion layer, we're like, oh, it's the circumstances. It's circumstances beyond my control, right? It's like the universe. Then the next layer is people. Other people. It's other people's fault. It's my board's fault. It's my donor's fault. It's a team. And, yeah. Right. And the core of it is where you retake your power, which is like, maybe it's me. Maybe I'm just not good enough yet. Maybe my marketing just isn't good enough. Maybe my fundraising just isn't good enough. Maybe my plan is just not good enough. And it's a scary thing to get to because no one wants to feel that they're not good enough. No one wants to feel incompetent. But I think the power in it is that 
if you can admit that it's you, then it's within your realm of control. I'm going to one-up you in terms of controversial and double down. (laughs) I don't think it's a maybe. I think in every situation where something is not going the way that you want it to go, it absolutely is you. It's not only you, (laughs) it's not just you, but it's, there are always different decisions we can make and things we can learn and gaps that we have. I think I shared with you a story of one of the leaders that I work with who shared some of the gaps between where they want to be and where they currently are with their team and their board and felt bad even sharing that with me. And I'm the coach, right? That is my job is to help you close those gaps. And my response was never apologize for the gaps. Do not waste time being ashamed of the things you don't know, the things you can't do. That's a waste of brain space because they're always going to be there. There are a thousand things, you know, you've known me for what, 20 years. And I like to say, I don't spend a lot of time patting myself on the back for the things I know. And there are a lot of things I know, but I also don't spend any time beating myself up about the things that I don't know. What I try to spend time doing and what you and I both tell the leaders that we work with is get really clear about what those gaps are. If you are afraid of them, you won't be honest about them. But when you aren't afraid of them and you can be honest about them, then we can fix them. There's always a, everything's figure out. Yeah. But only if you actually say, yeah, this is something I don't know. That is such a powerful thing to say. And it's the only way to grow. Yeah. I, it's so interesting. So again, going back to podcast, I was just listening to an interview with David Epstein right before this. And he he's all about how do you learn and grow? And part of it is like, A, the awareness of here where, the, where I have gaps B, here's the plan I'm going to pursue in order to fill those gaps. C, I'm going to practice. And then D, I'm going to measure, right? So if I know that I'm not good at, say, marketing, and that is a gap I need to fill to move my nonprofit forward or to move my business forward, then it's like, okay, well, then what do I need to learn? Who do I need to learn it from? And how do I know that I have improved in this way? And, And I think- just the process, of, you know, it goes back to Carol Dweck and like growth mindset. Like you, you don't know all of the things. Right. You're going to do a lot of things for the first time. The willingness to step into the discomfort of like, I don't know, and I'm going to make mistakes is uncomfortable for folks like us that are high achievers and is also where we need to step in if we want to continue to move things forward and to play a bigger game. I would say every organization that I've worked with where I have a thought in my head, wow, they are, this organization is going somewhere. Like there's going to be incredible impact if we keep our eye on this organization in the next you know, three to five years. In every single instance where I have had that thought, a big part of how the leader, the person at the helm, not the person owning everything, but the executive director has moved through the world has been this sense of, I'm standing on the edge of uncertainty. I have no idea what's coming next or how to necessarily do it, but I'm up for the challenge, right? And that doesn't mean they're not afraid. It just means they're like, I'm up for the challenge. And that mindset, it's it's everything, I think. Yeah, yeah. Well, it also just calls to mind, you know, the... Marshall Gantz, like challenge choice outcome, right? Look, in life, we are all going to be challenged. And I would say that 2024 has been very challenging for many of us. And within the challenge, you can decide. You can decide, am I going to, as you say, stand on the precipice and figure it out and find the people who can help me figure it out? Or am I going to, am I going to get my little baby feeling hurt and cry about it? There's no crying in (laughs) nonprofiting. You know, I thought it would be really interesting um, when you and I were talking about this a few days ago, we shared examples in our own nonprofit leadership (laughs) vault of this very thing, right? I think especially, I'll speak for myself, one of the things I try to be careful about in my coaching with the leaders that I work with is reminding them that I've been where they are, right? That I did not get everything right, ever, (laughs) right? That there were real failures. There were real times when, to your point, you know, I learned or thought I learned, I measured, and the measurement, the result was, nope, 
didn't nail this, right? Or there's still a huge gap. And I find that the concreteness of sharing my own experiences helps bring home for folks the fact that I'm not just giving lip service to the fact that they have to be able to fail forward, that really that is how you grow. I thought it would be interesting if we each just sort of shared some examples from our past. Oh God, where where can I even begin? <laughs> so many things. No. You know, um, I think some of the biggest mistakes I ever made were around staffing and hiring. So yeah. yes, so many mistakes. So without naming names, I think um, some of the mistakes that I've made were around hiring too quickly before I really understood who the person was hiring based simply on a really great interview and good references, like understanding that sometimes a person who shows up for the interview is not the same person who shows up for work. Um, certainly have made mistakes around keeping someone on too long that I know, like, I just knew that they were mediocre. I knew they weren't in the job. I knew that they didn't have the skill set to do it, but I, like, you know, there was like that part of me that like just really wants to believe, especially, you know, I think, yeah. So like I, I willed it into existence, you know, and I like did the, the plans and I set up the trackers for them and all the things. So, uh, holding on too long. And then, oh gosh, I, I think the other thing is not always handling exits gracefully because I think, look, I've had to fire people. I'm sure you've had to fire people and it's never comfortable. Um, and I don't think that I was ever callous about it, but I, I think that I, because especially the first couple of times that I had to do it, I deferred to being like, very corporate about it because that was the model that I had seen of like, well, okay, all these people are on my board and they say that I have to do it this way because of HR, et cetera, et cetera. So like, this is how we're going to do it. And, and, you know, and I think that it probably didn't feel very humane um, because, you know, I'm, I'm very warm and like, I have this kind of relationship in the minute I'm firing oh, someone, it's so like very corporate. So uh, I'll pause there. I could keep going, but what about you, Brooke? So one of my favorite stories to tell, and it's only my favorite because it's been like a decade and a half. And I think you've heard the story, maybe. Um, so my organization, when we turned five, I threw a big party and it was a fantastic party. Um, we had a DJ, it was in a loft, we gave out awards, we had this silent auction. It was just everything about it was perfect. We had city partners and corporate partners and like, Okay, it was great. So fast forward a year. And in my mind, I had checked the box of how to throw a great event, right? This was one area of fundraising that I didn't really need to focus on that much because clearly I had figured it out. And I had peers who were five, 10 years ahead of me in sort of nonprofit leadership being like, I do you think maybe you should have a host committee or do you think? Maybe you should do some cultivation. I was like, look, I understand that that works for you. Thanks yeah. so much. This I'm, I'm such a magical okay. snowflake. I don't need it. And, and, you know, <laughs> my approach to this, Bria has known me for a long time. So she's probably not surprised. She's sort of like, I hear what you're saying. I am good. So, so I went about my business and decided to throw a six-year party, rinse and repeat. Invites to the same people, same silent auction. I mean, literally rinse and repeat. And I'm going to let you guess how many people showed up at the party. I will say, just spoiler alert, we did not lose money on the event because people okay. I know will send money and it doesn't mean they're coming. But in terms of the actual event, guess oh, how many no. people? Oh, uh, no. Okay. It's amazing. It's amazing how many people. 30? Four. Shut up. Oh people. no, Brooke. Oh, that's so painful. And it's one of those things we're like, <laughs> I don't know if anyone listening has ever thrown a party where nobody comes. I had not until this party. And it was me, my sister, my sister's friend, because my sister always brought friends to my party, which was wonderful. And one of my board members. Oh no. Yeah. No, it was mortifying. <laughs> oh no. So the reason that I share that story with everyone is because I think it highlights a few things that 
that I learned. One, you can never rinse and repeat, right? That, and you've heard me say this, every organization as it grows becomes a different organism. It needs different strategies. What worked one year isn't necessarily gonna work the next year. And so you want to be testing and iterating. I did not do that. Another thing that I learned was, um, you know, when I came out of it, like I said, I was mortified. And I immediately thought to myself, oh, there's something I don't know here. Like, I, going back to your point, yeah, there were circumstances it was raining, right? Yeah, it's the people, my board didn't bring people. But I'm at the core of this organization. And obviously, there's something I missed. And I immediately went into, what did I miss? What do I have to learn, et cetera? Um, and I think that failing forward, was when I first saw about myself, oh, okay, if I spend a lot of time crying and beating myself up about this epic failure, I am leaving a lot on the table. Like actually the thing I need to do <laughs> is, act, is, is look at myself and figure out what didn't I do. Um, and I learned a lot, right? That was a really huge learning experience. Um, yeah. And yeah. it actually meant, so maybe two or three years later, my director of operations was putting together a series of cultivation events for us. And she kept stalling on getting me the plan. And finally, I was like, what's, there's something, there's a block here, because this isn't, you know, rocket science. And it turns out she was really afraid of letting me down, like really afraid of throwing events where nobody came. And so I told her this story and I was like, look, <laughs> the worst thing that can happen has already happened. So feel free to experiment. And that sense of we are going to mess up, that is okay, we have to learn. I tried to really infuse that into my team because I could actually point to a concrete epic thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But yeah. you know, herein lies the paradox though, right? Because on the one hand we can say like, oh, it's okay to fail, da, da, da. I often feel like, and I'll speak for myself, it's a like, do as I say, not as I do situation. Cause I'm like, oh yeah, failure, but not for me. Right. So I think that that's one thing. The second thing is, I think that the paradox is that while we want to embrace failure because it means we're trying things, we also are accountable to boards and boards are looking at us. And if we, and, screw up, and the people that we serve, right. And so they're looking at us like we are the ones leading them forward. And so if we screw up too much, then I think it calls into question our credibility. Agreed. And and then the third thing I'll say is I just I just want everyone listening to remember like it feels hard because it is hard. Like this is not easy stuff. You are all out here trying to solve intractable problems in the world. Like and for many of you, you're doing it for the first time. So it's not supposed to feel easy because it's not easy. That's right. Yeah. I'll share actually one other, I guess I'll call it a failure, learning opportunity <laughs> because I think your point about being accountable is a really important one. Um, I think it's a dance, right? I realize I, as the founder of my organization, had some privilege that some other executive, a lot of other executive directors don't have, that I was very careful to build a board that was truly a governance board. And also I was the founder, right? So if I failed a lot, the buck still sort of stopped with me to a certain extent. And there, there's a freedom in that. So I just want to sort of name that because that isn't necessarily freedom everyone feels. Um, I also think that that where we mess up is in improperly calibrating the balance between how accountable people allow us to feel to them and our ability to fail. To them. Because the reality is sometimes boards hold us accountable for things that aren't right, right? Boards, I think a lot about financial decisions or in where to invest money or what a budget should say. I'm going to go on record as saying eight times out of 10, the executive director is more correct about what a budget should look like than the board is. And yet that feeling of accountability gets in the way of 
not just taking chances and failing forward, but making smart decisions strategic decisions. So that dance between accountability and actually standing in your own power and saying, we're going to do this my way. Like I, I have insight here and I know how to do this. That's a really, that's a really hard dance for everybody, right? So if those yeah. of you listening, it feels hard to you, as Rhea said, that's a hard dance for everyone. Yeah. Yeah. And then as we're finishing up here, Brooke, I also just think it's important to know that you know, you and I have been around long enough to know that there are cycles. And when you're in a down cycle, not to get too down in the dumps about it. And when you're in an up cycle, like not to pat yourself too much on the back about it, like ebbs and flows. And I think when you, we see the ebb, it's actually an opportunity to get stronger, to up level the skills that you know that you probably didn't have it in a, in an up cycle right? Because you were just riding the waves. And I also think it, honestly, it clears the field a little bit. And I know that sounds harsh, but I think it separates the the women from the girls, as it were, right? If you're leading an organization and you know this has really been a, a time where you may be considering downscaling a little bit, or you may be considering even closing, I think there is an opportunity to also really stripped down to the essence and also to to do some hard thinking about like, who are we? Why do we exist? And is the reason that we exist still relevant? And if it is, can it exist in a new form, right? Can we think about a merger? Can we think about an acquisition? Can we think about partnerships? Like there, I I always just think about, um, you know, like Darwin and how the environment forces evolution. Yes. It really does, and and growth, right? right. Um, so the the last story I was going to share is a quicker one, not quite as funny, <laughs> not funny at all. Um, probably the toughest professional year I have ever had was one of the years in my organization, maybe about four years, five years before I left, um, where eight out of the twelve months we almost didn't make payroll. Like every single month for like the middle part of the year, it was a real struggle. You know, what were we going to pay late? Who was going to go on furlough, right? Like real tough questions. And I absolutely thought about mergers. I absolutely thought, I never thought, is there still relevance? But I did think, are we doing this the right way, right? Is there still a need? Does the market still, you know, need what we have? What I will say is coming out of the back end of that year, and you and I were talking about this a little bit before we got on the podcast, that sometimes the period of time right before your biggest and best growth feels chaotic. It feels either stagnant or messy or like you're messing up. You're sort of pushing through a growth edge. The three years following that year, were when we surpassed seven figures. We had the most amazing team. We expanded to three cities. We were the best, strongest version of our organization. I had more days where I looked and were like, oh my goodness, like this is, this is good. Mm -hmm. After that really tough year. And it was because of what you highlighted, right? I came out of the year towards the back end and I sat down with my leadership team and I said, what's a better way to do this? Mm -hmm. I leveled my fundraising. I had different kinds of conversations with my funders. I got brave in my conversations with donors. We revisit our, like we just got really surgical about the right next steps to take, where we had gaps, et cetera. Um, And we got stronger, right? I will pat myself on the back for that. We were a better organization on the back end because we looked at what we were learning and started to fill in gaps. And I think for those of you listening for whom 2024 or any part of the last few years have felt at best stagnant, at worst like chaos, the way through is through. Yeah. Right? The way through is to say, what's the, how can we grow? Um, and don't see it as, you know, to your point, Rhea, don't see it as, as the ending, like a place you have to be stuck. 
it's a season you're in and what's the next season that's coming. Yeah. Two things that I'll say is, you know, there's that term, you know, rough seas make good sailors. Like we're coming out of a rough sea, y'all. And so (laughs) I just want to highlight, like, it's not easy, but that is the job. And then the second thing I'll just say as a plug is if you're listening to this and you're like, I really resonate with this and I actually would like someone to help me with this. Brooke, you have a program. I have a program. We have been in the game for 20 years. We've seen, I don't want to say we've seen it all, but we've seen a lot. Most and of so it. <laughs> you've seen most of it. And we've worked with hundreds of organizations. Between the two of us, I'm sure we've worked with at least a thousand organizations. We've seen patterns emerge. And so if you're listening to this and you're and you want support and you want someone to help you kind of see the patterns and see how it might go. Look at Brooke's program. Look at my program. Brooke, your program is really designed for more sort of the strategic growth and operational organizational growth. My program is really focused on major donor giving, which to me is kind of the next level of how you get to financial sustainability. So Brooke, I'm going to make sure to put all of your info in the show notes. I know that you are doing a launch in October. Yeah, the, but the doors are open. We just enrolled three people as, you know, you know, um, in the last few weeks, it's called the Next Level Nonprofit Accelerator. Um, and um, yeah, we'll include the link in the show notes. Yeah, I think the big takeaway here, and it's the thing that maybe you and I probably didn't do as well. I don't know, I'll speak for myself. You don't have to do it alone, right? And I think the, probably if I really reflect on it, the biggest mistake I probably made is I didn't call in mentors and coaches early enough in the process. And I, so I just, I, I grounded out. I just like doubled down. I worked harder. And frankly, I really burned myself out without actually realizing that I could ask for help. I could ask for someone like yourself who's been there, done that, and could help me you know, see around the potential obstacles to let me know like, oh, by the way, a big boulder's coming towards your face. You might want to watch out. And and I, I think I really perceived asking for help as a sign of weakness when in actuality, the learning I should have taken away was it was actually a measure of strength to know when I needed help. I love that. All right, Brooke. Good to see you as always, my love. This is, as always, a fantastic conversation. Thanks for having me. Bye.